You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. Dr. Tesorari, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. We are uh, so happy to have you on. So uh, welcome to the podcast. Terrific. Thanks for inviting me. Very excited. And uh, I'm impressed after a long day in the OR, you have the energy to do this. <laughs> well, you know, I always enjoy, you know, learning, um, learning about different topics and, you know, you know, different people and, you know, it's kind of what we're what we're here for. You know, we're here to learn. I'm in residency, fourth year, so I'm just here to learn as much as I can. So, can't skip up any any time to to learn. You know, from a master like yourself. So again, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate it, and and uh, thank you. And so, you know, kind of first things what we do is we just kind of start to you know the podcast, just starting just general questions, getting to know you a little bit better. So, you know, one question I have is what you know brought you towards academic medicine we know there are a lot of different you know practice models but what made you want to go into the academic side of things that's a great question and uh i've been asked that a lot and i I think you know the 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 idea of uh academic medicine versus private practice i i think in the past certainly when i was making that decision uh i think it was a little more clear there were people who were involved with big universities that you know, you, you knew what your role was when you were going to work with residents and teach. Uh, and then there were the private guys that kind of came, you know, in and, you know, were there for the residents, but didn't play as much of a role. But that changed, especially in sports medicine, you know, over the last 10 to 15 years with the development of, you know, the Arthroscopy Association. And, and that's been around much longer. There, there has been this idea that you can still be a private practitioner Um, and still do research. And I think that's what the power of the Arthroscopy Association of North America, you know, showed, you know, showed me. And there's certainly a lot of private practice people. And the one that comes to mind that has published probably the most prolific stuff on shoulder arthroscopy has been Steve Burkhart. You know, he he, he was out of San Antonio. He's always been in private practice, you know. So I, I, I think, the, the idea of you can still be in academic medicine and still make a, a, la, a, a powerful impact um, to the way we practice orthopedics and still be in private practice. But for me, where I trained at NYU, it has a long history, starting with the Hospital for Joint Diseases and merging with NYU, of, of a very rich tradition in teaching residents and residency education. So for me, that was very important. And I learned in that environment and I saw these faculty members that were dedicated uh, to teaching us. And I was so impressed with that. And they took it almost, uh, you know, as a responsibility that they were teaching the future, you know, physicians that would take care of patients. And, and they really, um, that was very important to them because we are, the, we are the future, you know, you are the future. So we have to teach you well so that you are able to take care of patients the correct way. And, you know, for me, that's um, a privilege to do that. And the thing about academic medicine I I love is that it's a hobby for me, you know, answering questions, asking questions and figuring it out in, in sort of that scientific method, you know, hypothesis, testing whether it's true and actually applying it in orthopedics. That's what's great about orthopedics. You can, have an idea like a, a new implant or a new way to fix stuff and you can do a randomized you know you know controlled study and, and I think that's just amazing that you can answer a question that impacts a patient patient's life uh, you know over the course of a two-year study where you do follow-up et cetera and find out yes this is a good thing to do or no this is a bad thing to do and uh, uh, it's very the, the feedback in orthopedics is very quick. So with these surgeries <laughs> right. that we do, we get the answer pretty quickly as opposed to some of these medical studies, which are very long, drawn out. Um, you need extensive follow-up for them. So for me, you know, it, it's working with colleagues that have the same passion, you know, for, you know, producing research. Uh, it, it, it makes it even better for me. 
Yeah, and you can, I mean, just hearing you talk about it, you can definitely see how passionate you are uh, about this topic and about this subject. And I'm sure uh, the residents that you work with are, are, are very excited and, and, and you know, happy to, to work with you and learn from you. And um, for those that are listening, they're thinking about academics that maybe, you know, that's, that's something right there, you know, that, that may sway you towards one way versus the other. Uh, but moving forward is, this is a question we've been asking on the podcast re- recently, and it's, it's been interesting to see everybody's responsive and, and, and they've been different responses but is there a book that you have gifted to others uh, or told them to read this can be an orthopedic book or it can be a non-orthopedic book but any books that you have suggested or, or gifted to others so it, it's always that's always that's a great question by the way and it's it, it's something that over the years um i've thought about very carefully in terms of you know what can I give that would impart a lot of the way I feel about life and orthopedics? Cause there are many orthopedic textbooks out there. And the last thing I want to do is give a textbook that I re- wrote to someone that I've trained. I am I, 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 not sure that um, means as much what I want to, you know, usually uh, try to give the fellows and what I've given them in the past is a book of poetry. So hmm. for me, it's not that I'm into necessarily poetry, but one specific poet that hit home, you know, and his words are very, you know, meaningful to me is this Lebanese poet, uh, Khalil Gibran. And there's a, there's a lot out there um, that he's written quotes that, you know, uh, like one of them is ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your Mm. country. You know, yep. it's it's, it's um, attributed to JFK a lot, but it's really it's from him, Khalil Gibran, this Lebanese poet. Uh, my wife's Lebanese uh, of Lebanese descent, and she turned me on to him. And mm. uh, I, 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 he talks about love, marriage, life, and uh, it's just in in a matter of six sentences, he kind of in, imparts everything from raising children and how you should do that, et cetera. So uh, to me, that's the book that I try to give my fellows or, or residents that I've worked closely with. And uh, it, it has a lot of life lessons in it. And I think, you know, as a teacher, um, that's one thing, in addition to teaching them orthopedics, you try to give them your perspective on life. You've been, you're older, I'm 53 now. Uh, so uh, I've made a lot of mistakes, both orthopedic wise, uh, and just general from, you know, buying homes and whatever, you know, it's just, you know, imparting that knowledge so that you can hopefully miss some of those mistakes that were made along the way, uh, uh, in life and, and make your life that much better. So that's, that's, that's my goal. If at the end, if I'm going to give something, I try to give something like that. And Khalil Gibran and his poetry, uh, it's one of my favorite books. No, I think that's a great goal to have. And I think that is, um, you know, that's a great response. And that's definitely a book I'll probably need to check out at some point. You know, probably rather sooner than later. I think it's always good. You know, you know, everybody has different nuggets and gems and different experiences, which makes them that person. So being able to uh, impart some knowledge on somebody else is always great. And you kind of b- touched on it briefly, but do you have any interests outside of the field of orthopedics? Cause we know we're all, you know, we love orthopedics. Do you have any interests outside of orthopedics? Uh, outside of orthopedics, I, I, over the years, I used to love baseball and softball. So I played in college. So as you become an orthopedic surgeon and you know this, our, our time is limited, so it becomes much more challenging to get a group of nine guys followed by you got to get nine more guys to play again. So that's 18 individuals um, uh, to play a game at a set time. And that's yeah. that's challenging. So uh, I would say about 15, maybe 18 years ago, I picked up uh, martial arts and jujitsu. So nice. uh, at some point when I came back home, we, I had two kids in residency. So from the moment we had those two kids, exercising basically stopped. So mm. uh, I took care of my two kids during residency. We took them to fellowship. There were two and three 
in fellowship. And we went down to Alabama. Uh, we're from New York and wife, God bless her. Um, we, you know, we, we, she took care of the kids, but it was a challenging time with traveling to a lot of these games. And even coming back as a young attending, taking trauma call and things like that with two kids, it, it was challenging. And there's no doubt that you, you kind of put things to the side. And then it, I guess at some point I said, you know what, I got to do something or I didn't have that, uh, that good life work balance going. So I picked up this thing, jujitsu. I was watching UFC fights at the time and I said, this is pretty cool. Uh, so I said, I walked in and uh, I was, you know, overweight uh, at the time. I still am a little overweight, but at some point during those 15 years, I was able to get my black belt uh, wow. in jujitsu. So, and, you know, it was almost to the point that if I didn't go almost every night, it, it balanced the most stressful times in my life and was a good release valve for me, especially with, in orthopedics, where you, there could be a lot of pressure in terms of whatever it is, getting research done, uh, challenging cases and things like that. So that was that was my um, that was my outlet. So uh, and I still do it. Uh, I do it less now. Just, you know, we have I have a, uh, my two other daughters are are going to medical school. So uh, they're taking one took the MCAT. The other one is taking mm. the MCAT. And I got a younger yeah. one who's 13. So now she's become the main focus now. So, uh, 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 so we're taking care of her and doing things with her. So, you know, while, while I don't go every night, I go about once or twice a week, but it, it is certainly, uh, the thing that I've gravitated. I don't do, I don't golf, uh, uh, I golf only at our tournaments, but that's, and, uh, you know, general exercise, like CrossFit type exercises. So that's, the, the, those are my outlets. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. I'm actually a big MMA fan myself, and have done some, uh, some Brazilian BJ, BJJ or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in the past when I was in college, and and, and I'm looking yeah. forward to getting back uh, to it. But anyways, I, I can talk about that for, for a while. But yeah, yeah. we can switch gears and, and talk uh, and get into our little talk about today. We're going to talk about labral tears, and I just had this, you know, kind of just made up case that I that I um, that I thought of just to kind of get us going here. Uh, for having to switch gears so say for example uh dr Desrari, a 21 year old male who's a b baseball player presents to your office with shoulder pain um and he has a clicking sensation in his shoulder after falling and trying to catch himself by grabbing onto a pole um uh, now we're going to get into labor and talks here in a bit but just just to give a little bit of background can you kind of go over what the you know the what the labrum is and kind of the anatomy of the labrum and then after that we can go into you know a little bit of classifications sure so in, in terms of the labrum so you think of the glenoid you know sort of as this you know circular structure it's like a clock right so you've got labrum which is like bumper tissue or you know some people call it even fibrocartilage like um that is around this circle. So you have labrum in the front. We tend to call that an anterior labrum. And if that tears, that's called a bank art tear. Then you have the posterior labrum uh, that's in the back. Some people classify the, the labrum inferiorly as the inferior labrum, but it's really anterior and posterior. And then this concept of the superior labrum, that's at the top or the 12 o'clock position and how it sort of integrates with the biceps tendon is what we call the superior labral complex. Um, and uh, they're, they're, whether you define the posterior labrum as going up to a certain amount. So anything that's between, assuming the biceps is at 12, between one o'clock and 11 o'clock, they consider part of the superior labrum anterior to posterior complex or what you call defined as a slap tear. And there are many different types, but that was historically Snyder, Steve Snyder um, described four types, which you're gonna get into with, you know, and, and this was something that was interesting that became certainly during my time when I trained uh, in, with Jim Andrews in 2000, was just in the overhead athlete becoming a big deal, you know, finding these, these tears. Now there are other ways you can tear it, but you know, 
the classic one that we we talk about is the type two, right? Where it's detached and the biceps is pulling off of it. Type one is a degenerative one. Type three is a bucket handle, which I've seen a bunch of. And I've really seen more of a type four type lesion where it really extends into the biceps anchor itself. So really twos and fours. And then you can go into, well, if the tear extends more anteriorly. So, right. You start to get in these other types, which, you know what? I I think if you really critically look at slap tears in general, you know, they're, they're a lot more type five than you think. A lot of these anterior tears extend up into the superior labrum. And we know that, you know, it's a circle concept. So if you have a patient with instability in their shoulder, if you're tearing one part of that circle, you really, to address the instability, have to sort of fix all of the circle to, uh, to address that. So these are where these, you know, you know, it, these were described. Uh, I don't know if they were described by Snyder afterwards, but Snyder w- was uh, credited with the first four. And then you can see how there's a variety of them. And type seven is interesting. It does go into the middle glenohumeral ligament or what we co- consider a capsular you know, injury as well. And, and that is not an uncommon thing that uh, I've seen that in athletes before with a traumatic dislocation. So I, I mean, these, but the ones that we talk most about are the type two slap tear. Right. And, and just to, just to kind of summarize, so the type one slap tears, those are those degenerative ones where you just kind of have the, you know, the, the fraying of the labor and the biceps and the type two, which is, the ones you hear mostly about is when you have detachment of that superior labrum and the biceps and the difference between that type two and a, and a type four is because you have, uh, when you have a type four is you have detachment of the superior labrum and the biceps anchor and the tear actually extends into the biceps tendon. So that's what kind of differentiates the two and a four and a three is a bucket handle. And then there's a, you know, the modification to the Snyder with, you know, type five, six, sevens, which you're talking about, uh, and then I see some all, go all the way up to 10. Right. Um, but I know this I mean, had I, to do I, with just. I, it's more of a research classification and for outcomes and things like that. Like when I look at type nine, for example, that's that's what I call a circumferential labral, you know, tear. And that's how they describe it on uh, an MRI. The, the, the labrum is torn circumferentially all the way around. And that's a type, you know, nine. Uh, so. Uh, I, I've rarely seen these classified like this in, in, you know, by radiologists or in MRI reports. Okay. And so when we're thinking about these, uh, you know, these label tears, how do they happen? Like, I guess kind of what is the, what's the mechanism for which these occur? Is, you know, is there any certain type of, I know it can be a different, couple of different categories, but what's the mechanism for how these types of right. injuries occur? So, so uh, before I get into what Steve, uh, Snyder described as some of the causes for these, you've got to understand that the most common mechanism for these is nothing. They're degenerative tears. Okay. Yeah. And I think yes, that's very important to understand that you're going to see a ton of these on MRIs in patients older than 50. It is very common. And uh, I think, you know, certainly the idea of fixing these first came out Um and I think, you know, in, in the early 2000s, it was very, very popular to indicate patients with slap tears who were older than 50. Oh, and you got you had to fix that because they were in pain. And right. they, had a, they may have had a rotator cuff, partial or even a full. But the idea that, OK, it's torn, we have to fix it became very popular. And then we started throwing these anchors in into the biceps area not understanding that, hey, and I think this is something very important for residents to understand that the fact that it's torn doesn't mean it should be fixed. And I think that's something, you know, that's our first inclination. We're orthopedic surgeons. We got to fix these things. But the answer is that it's degenerative for a reason. And most patients are asymptomatic, okay, for the most part. So I think, so now that you know that, what are some traumatic ways that you can tear? Well, the second most common way that I see it is some type of repetitive overuse motion in an overhead athlete. Now, the definition of an overhead athlete has really expanded. It, 
first, it was a pitcher, right? So, yeah, they put their arm in the over position, throw the ball. Okay, easy. What about a javelin thrower? Same concept. They're not a baseball thrower, but they're doing that. What about a CrossFit athlete who's doing a lot of pull-ups? Yeah, maybe that's considered an overhead athlete too. But the concept is, is this repetitive rotation, you know, and whether it's a CrossFit athlete um, throwing a weight, you know, above their heads or doing a clean and jerk, whatever it is, it's this rotational phenomenon that causes torquing, like in this nice picture you have, and triggers biceps to tear. The other one that's that I've seen before is someone lifting a heavy weight, you know, moving furniture, for example, and it, it kind of gives and their arms extend, not extend, it, their arms are pulled down and you're sort right. of pulling the ball out of the socket effect. And remember, the, the biceps is in the groove, the transverse humeral ligaments hold it in place. So if there's any type of motion, it's locked in that transverse humeral ligament in the groove. So any type of pulling, you know, oh, or the other one is a water skier, right? Who's his arm gets pulled out as the boat's going, and they and that can also cause an acute slap tear. But what you're showing here is the most common thing, and I think the most impressive thing is if you're you're in surgery, is to actually rotate the arm and t- put him in this position, and you'll see sort of this motion at the level of the biceps anchor, whether it's You'll see it in a normal, you know, non-slap tear and also in a slap tear. It is this pathology, this this rotation that causes the biceps to pull, almost like pulling a weed out of of the grass where you kind of rock back and forth and and you finally are able to to lift it up. Yeah, and I think that's that that peel back mechanism that you're talking about, and um and yes, yeah, just just summarizing what you're just saying, you know, you kind of have that torsional uh, effect of the biceps tendon on the labrum, which you so nicely described a little bit earlier of our anatomy, and then most another very common thing that you see is just kind of this overuse symptoms and definitely your your overhead athletes, and so you know so if, you know we have these patients they come in and you know they're a thrower they've had this you know this maybe an acute event. What are some things that you that you look for you know in history when you're getting a history from these people or, or what do they present with like what do they tell you or what are some common findings that you you've seen in your future in your uh, practice. Right. So I, I think the, the history you gave. So for me, when I, you know, when someone's presenting the case to me, so he's 21. Okay. Is he a college? Is he, does he play collegiate baseball? Is he, is he a thrower? Is he a pitcher? You know, what's his future aspirations? Uh, does he want to throw later on? So these are, all these are important because the concept of, you know, th- this, you described a thrower with a traumatic injury, sort of like, pulling which is yes, w- yeah which is not the most common thing where it presents but nonetheless it, it, i think it's important because it does dictate you know what what you may potentially do and you may you may place more importance on what you find on the mri based on the history but what do i see in these patients so they come in so they come in in two varieties let's focus on the the baseball pitcher sort of yes, you know the uh uh, the overhead thrower. So they come in typically complaining about something with their velocity or their ability to throw, uh, uh, their accuracy and their, you know, fatigue. And sometimes they say, well, my hand is numb as well when I throw. So that opens up a whole host of, well, is this thoracic outlet syndrome? But right. what, what and then if you get more into the theory of, of a slap tear, and I'll get into the symptoms, but you talked about this rotational stress. Well, it's going to happen to everyone, but why do some athletes get slap tears and why do so- others don't? One of the theories with internal impingement uh, is this concept of as you're doing that throwing that they're fatiguing, for example. And then what ends up happening is that because of that fatiguing, there's a certain part of their capsule that starts to scar in. So one of the theories is that all of a sudden, 
there's abnormal forces. Now you're getting this pseudo laxity where the posterior inferior capsule tightens up a little bit. Then the head, the humeral head starts to go anterior superior. And what does that do? It accentuates that torquing mechanism. So, um, I believe it was, uh, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm blanking on his, Dr. Morgan, Craig Morgan talked about, if you caught the athletes early on with this posterior um, inferior capsule contracture, and you would see it, and, and you, again, this is getting into the love of taking care of the overhead athlete. When you look at their rotation, right, you, you, they always have more external rotation compared to right. internal rotation. It's just a developmental thing. You can, whether it's, you know, they have a developmental, more humoral version, or even, you know, their glenoid version has changed. Nonetheless, they have this greater external rotation compared to internal rotation. But when you compare both arms, they should have an equal total arc, we call it. When right. you start to have a difference of 15 degrees, when they start to lose excessive internal rotation, that means that something is up, okay? And this is why it's important to examine these patients because some of these patients have what they call the prodrome. And if you catch them early enough and with good therapy, you stretch out that post inferior capsule, you can balance the forces out and take stress off their, their biceps anchor. So really when you, when you have an athlete that's complaining of some early discomfort in their shoulder, it's really important to examine them and assess that internal rotation. When they complain, when they, when they, so Sometimes they complain of vague pain. It may be very early in sort of the, uh, uh, the slap pathology. But they typically complain. They can complain of posterior pain or even anterior pain, depending on, one, what, what's going on with their rotator cuffs. A lot of them have some partial undersurface rotator cuff tears that can impact their physical exam. They really complain of... Uh, sort of mechanical popping, catching or grinding. I, and I agree, if there's an unstable flap, they may, but most of them who are elite throwers or high level pitchers, they're coming in very early because they are not happy with what's going on when they're thrown. Um, so they'll come in a lot early. Whereas the traumatic people who have the traumatic uh, injuries that we described, yeah, they may have more popping and catching. Like this individual, even though he's a pitcher, he had this traumatic injury, it's possible that they may feel their shoulder sublux a little bit because the superior labrum does play a role in, in some uh, stability as well in the shoulder. Um, and then other associated conditions uh, with slap tears. Well, they could, what you want to look for, and this is one thing I tell the residents, always examine them with their shirt off, right? You know, there are a lot of these high level throwers who have atrophy, in their back mus you know, musculature, either the supra or the infraspinatus. And sometimes these slap tears are associated with spinal glenoid notch cysts where they could impinge either on the suprascapular nerve uh, as, it, uh, you know, as it comes out of the transverse scapular notch, you know, or at the spinal glenoid notch, just knocking out the infraspinatus. And we see a lot of throwers who also have traction related you know, uh, uh, issues, which we see in a lot of volleyball players where one of those nerves, particularly the, uh, the branch at the spinal glenoid notch, which feeds the infra, um, be stretched and they're weak in external rotation. It doesn't mean they have a slap tear. It could mean that they have uh, this you know, neuro neuropathy type condition that's all related to throwing. And we can debate on whether those need to be released or not another time. But, <laughs> you know, th that, that's typically, you know, what their complaints are. You know, and sometimes they're very vague in their in describing where their shoulder pain. They just say it's deep inside. And when you examine their rotator cuff, for example, most of them are very strong. So, you know, they don't have, you know, the findings classic of rotator cuff pathology. And I agree, yeah. the physical exam is challenging, you know. So you you there's no sensitive, there's no specific test. Whether you use the active compression test, bringing your arm over uh, and your thumbs down, this, this has been described. There's a bunch of other, you know, so just to, you know, um, explain this test, I like this test. And while, uh, you know, it's been described to be the most sensitive and 
you know, maybe not the most specific, but the most sensitive. The idea is that as you, and, and you should test it on some of the patients. So you would think that a rotator cuff pathology would cause them discomfort in this position, but it's interesting. Right. It, it, it doesn't necessarily always cause them. So when their arms are typically in the out position like this, you know, these, these, they're very strong, you know, these athletes, their rotator cuffs good. Then all of a sudden you kind of bring their arm across the body. You think that, well, you know, they should still be strong, but as their thumb goes down, it torques the biceps and it, it really does, you know, they all of a sudden become painful. So for me, that sharp contrast of being out here uh, and, you know, the empty can test, you know, testing the supraspinase and crossing it over your body and all of a sudden being painful. And then it gets better as you bring your thumb up. To me, that's a very powerful test. So this mm. to me, you know, is my main workhorse for picking up slap tears. Um, and then I think the key thing to understand on this is you got to look at the AC joint as well, because this test, because of the way the arm is positioned by crossing it across, you know, cross arm adduction, that's also going to irritate the AC joint. So if they have AC joint pathology, they will point to the AC joint as part of their uh, pain as well. So you got to make sure you're not getting fooled. Um, these patients have positive tests is where they point pain deep in their shoulder. Yeah. And, and just to reiterate, a recap of some of the things that you were mentioned about, um, you mentioned on, you know, on, on symptom wise, when you speak to these patients that a lot of them sometimes will complain of posterior shoulder pain, but they may also have anterior shoulder pain. And, and, and you said that they may kind of just present saying, you know, something's just off my shoulder, um, you know, maybe throwing power or whatever, or whatever it may be. And then, you know, if you, very less le less common it would be an unstable flap where they get mechanical popping uh, or, or symptoms such as you know when they're when their shoulder subluxes and just to reiterate when you're talking about the physical exam findings a couple of things that you mentioned is one is looking at their total arc of of, of motion uh, which we know that like you said a little bit earlier that throwers are going to have a little bit more external rotation with their throwing arm compared to their other arm but their total arc of motion will be similar to uh, on both so when you have a decrease in the arc of motion in, in one arm versus the other that may cool you in towards there may be other things going on in the shoulder yeah. at, you know gird or whatever else it may be um For other things about, that you i, I look at ahead. about 15, 15 degrees is my 15 degrees my cut off that anything above 15 degrees is pathologic anything below that you know you can have variations in humeral anatomy bony anatomy because they're throwing so I'll, I'll chalk it up to that. I still will do a posterior capsular stretching program or sleeper stretch. But once it okay. starts to get above 15, I start to get a little more worried. And that something is, is yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and and that's what we we look for for range of motion. And another thing that you mentioned is on physical examination is you have them take their shirts off and you look to see if there is any atrophy. You mentioned um, having, uh, you could have a cyst that's compressing the spinal gland or notch which could be compressing one of the nerves, which could be leading to uh, uh, issues with the, the infraspinatus. Like you said, it may have some uh, weakness with external rotation, maybe something that you may be on the lookout for. Then you mentioned um, O'Brien's active compression test where you had the arm forward flex and adducted a little bit and your thumb down, which torques the biceps and, and that causes them pain. And then once you, uh, once you supinate or externally rotate their arm, their pain is relieved, which is a positive test for this. Now, are you, how, how important is the biceps test in this? And are, I know there, there are multiple tests out there for the biceps, but how, how important is it? Cause you know, a big part of this, uh, this decision making for our label tears is our history and physical examination. So we want to make sure we get that down packed, but how do you check the biceps in every one of these patients? And if so, how do you do so? It, you know, it, it's the, the idea of the physical exam. This used to be extremely important w before the advent of higher quality MRIs. And for me, you know, when I do speeds and Jurgensen's tests, I find these very nonspecific and not yep. necessarily very sensitive, you know, yep. to find out. And, and I would tell you that isolated biceps pathology is rare. Okay. Uh, uh, there are some authors who think it's more common, but I've rarely seen isolated biceps pathology. Slap tears okay. are different, right? But isolated 
proximal biceps tendonitis. Uh, It's rare. Uh, uh, I just don't see it. Now, I think the thing that's often missed is a small, subtle upper border subscap tear that's there. That's the biceps is kind of subluxating into it slightly. I think that's a very, the speeds and Jurgensen's become more positive with that. That's really where when you do these tests, all of a sudden the, the biceps is dipping into there and they'll start to complain of pain anteriorly. So that's what I, yeah. that's really when I talk about proximal biceps tendonitis, it's really, you, you don't miss that upper border, you know, subscap tear. So if they start having pain anteriorly, I'm thinking a whole host of things, but think subscap tear, make sure you do subscap tests and think, you know, something's up with the proximal biceps, meaning that it's dipping into that, you know, upper border subscap tear. And everything we do, right, is it's all based on what are we going to do surgically or how are we going to treat these patients? So if you know that an upper border subscap tear that is associated with biceps pathology and not to do anything to the biceps tendon, i.e. tenonomy or tenodesis, the, to me, that's crazy. You know, it, it, it's, you know, that that's the pathology, you know, it's a dynamic thing. So when you're in, you're in the OR, you're not going to really see that much. Okay. Now, granted a more significant upper border subscap tear, you'll actually get a dislocation or significant subluxation, but there are more subtle ones and they've described, you know, a whole host of pulley lesions associated with bicep stuff. While those exist, I think, you know, you, don't, you know, look for the zebras in the forest, really look for the most common thing. If you see that upper border subscap, whether you decide to fix it or not is debatable. Some of these upper border subscaps, you can let go, but to not address biceps there would be a big mistake. And those are the patients that just don't get better when they have surgery or what we call a debridement. But I, yes, again, sir. just, I, I know I rambled on there, but just to, <laughs> no problem. You know, go, go for just, it. Just to, su- just to sum up with the the exam speeds and Jurgensen's, I still do. I still incorporate them. I used to incorporate a lot of these other slap specific tests like the Kim one, the Kim two test. But to me, you know, I, I'm, I'm using the O'Brien's test or the active compression test. Some of the rotator cuff exam, the subscap tests, the, these tests I'll use as well. And then I'm getting an MRI on almost everyone. And then what I do when I review the MRI and we can go, yeah. And I get, they, they, they come before they even see me with x-rays and yes, sir. whether, you know, so you can go back to the x-rays. And so I, I like all, all the views down here. So what do we see? I, I guess the question that often comes up is what information can the x-rays give you? And do you right. need to get x-rays? Well, why don't I just, you know, patients always ask these questions. And, and I think what I'm looking for is a couple of things on the x-ray. I'm looking for the glenoid version. Some of these patients that come in sometimes have glenoid dysplasia. And, you know, those are patients that really, you know, especially posterior shoulder pain, some that have excessive retroversion, you know, you're, you're, you may not, you, they're a different patient population. You're not going to necessarily address them with some of the more routine things. And you'll see the version obviously on the, the outlet view. So I also look at, so sometimes you can see uh, on, on the imaging something like calcific tendonitis. Some of these, you know, patients get, you know, calcific tendonitis as well. On the outlet view, uh, I'm looking also for, you know, the type of spurring. I, I would say the acromial morphology, you know, is more important in, in rotator cuff stuff. But if you're, if you're looking at someone that has this huge hook or huge spur coming off the, uh, chromium. And for me, that is important because that's not necessarily normal. So w- they talk about, oh, you don't need to do a subacromial decompression for some rotator cuff. Well, if you have this big hook or spur digging into the rotator cuff and you're seeing it arthroscopically, then it'd be stupid not to, you know, address that. So I, I think, right. you know, sometimes when you read these things, it's all about common sense too. Uh, it's a very mechanical thing that we do as orthopedic surgeons. And I think to understand that it is important. Um, in terms of the, uh, the AP views, I think getting a true, you know, 
uh, AP view where you're getting, seeing the Glennon Foss to get up to see certain degrees of arthrosis are important. Um, and so th that's what I'm using the x-rays uh, in okay. these overhead athletes. Yes, sir. And, and just to reiterate, just, you're just saying, you know, looking at Gracie, you can see the, um, uh, right, the glenoid uh, morphology. You can all see it on an axillary, uh, right. la axillary lateral. On your scap Y, you can look at your uh, chromium. You can look at the shape of your chromium if it's a hook shape. Um, other things you're talking, you can kind of look at the chromium on, on your APs and look at your critical shoulder angle. You know, these are all things. But I know you're, that's more for rotator cost, but right. that's those are all kind of um, little minute details that you can get from scrutinizing the, scrutinizing the x-rays. Now, when we look for at MRIs, what exactly are you looking for? I, I always have a hard time, and I still still sometimes have a hard time uh, seeing it and saying, oh, this is a this is a slap tear, a labral tear. But in, in, your, in, in your eyes, when you're looking through this, what are you looking for? And, and what do we see in these patients that can possibly have labral tears? Yeah, so I, I think we'll, we'll, there's a lot of things when you look at an MRI. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it's... And I think as um, I think as a as a resident, it's very important to sort of methodically go through these. And it's almost uh, you should do it the same way every time. And I encourage you. There's an article uh, that talks about the MRI evaluation of subscap tears. Um, okay, we'll find that. I, I th yeah, I, I think that's very you know important to review because it'll go, yep. that's the most common thing that's missed is subscap tears and biceps pathologies. Um, Chris Adams wrote. Um, okay. So yeah, look that up. So I think that that's important. I'm not going to get into that because that's outside the scope of what we're doing, but it, it is intimately related to the biceps tendon and to understand and be able to pick up those things on the axillary review is important. However, right. the slap, the slap tear you're going to see is on the coronal shots. And for me, if you look at this first picture, um, you can see almost that I, I, I can't tell somebody, it looks like that's an arthrogram. Am I, am I right? Or yeah, is that? Yes, sir. I yeah. So, yes. so, so you, you can, sometimes some of these good quality MRIs, you can get an arthrogram almost type effect where uh, they're, they're able to make it almost look like the patient had the arthrogram. But what, what I'm looking for is as you start to go to that superior labrum, there should be no kind of fluid entering the triangle up top, which is a superior labrum. Once you start to see fluid entering exactly in that area, that's where you start to consider slap. So slap tears. Now, you'll see fluid sometimes undermining, you know, between the bone on the glenoid and the actual labrum. Now, if it sort of stops and has sort of this blunted affect where it's, it's not sort of uh, so uh, jagged, then, then there's this thing called sublabral foramen. And I know that's more anteriorly, but there are clefts and a lot of variations with slap, you know, slap tears as well um, and normal morphology. Now, if the fluid just extravasates up there and it's more extensive, that's obviously an acute type two slap tear. But for me, I'm really focusing on any sort of this fluid extending into or underneath that sort of little triangle up top. And then obviously if there's a cyst there, you know, spinal glenoid cyst, that is pathognomonic. You wrote it there. Look at that. To me, that, <laughs> that, that is absolutely, there's a slap tear. You know, it's rare that you'll see them uh, uh, de novo. Can you? Yes, I've seen them, but uh, it's rare. So I, I, I wouldn't focus on, you know, again, those zebras. I would focus on what's more common. Yes, sir. And, and we could, have a whole podcast on how to how to read a shoulder MRI, which yeah. you probably will in the future. Um, but just kind of continuing forward and, and talking about, you know, so, so we, you know, we have our patient and, you know, they, they've, they've come in, we've diagnosed them with the labral tear. What kind of goes into, how do you decide who's getting non-op treatment and then, and then how do you decide uh, which ones you operate? Yeah. So that's obviously a great question. So the question, the, the, the questions go back to the history. What's, what's this individual's, uh, aspirations. Does he get to play baseball next year? You know, where are we in the season? Is he a starter? Uh, so these all come into play as I start to make a decision. If, for example, he's off season 
and we've documented the slap here, and he's a thrower. And this is his only time that he may need to get it fixed. That At least the idea of surgery starts to go through my mind just because of the unique circumstances that if we fail non-operative treatment, he may miss the, he may miss the season if we delay the surgery and then he may have to redshirt, whatever it is. It, it at least opens up the discussion. But for me, I, I'm a big believer in rehab and seeing what happens. And now the younger you are, the more athletic you are, and someone like a thrower, obviously the thought and the discussion of surgery becomes more paramount. Now, with a spinal glenoid notch cyst and someone like this who had an acute traumatic injury, yeah, everything becomes more important pushing towards surgery. And certainly if there's, you know, nerve compression, usually um, if the cyst is large enough where it's causing acute compression on the nerve, generally it's not like that. Generally it's a more of a chronic thing that kind of develops and the cyst sort of develops. That, that, that's a different story. And we know on those patients when we ask them, and sometimes I will aspirate them if they're in season, just to okay. take pressure off the nerve. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And then do the, do the surgery um, at the end of the season to get them through uh, that, uh, depending on their level and depending on discussion with the family if they're younger. But, you know, for me, the failure rate, like you suggested, is high in, in this sort of throwing population. Um uh, especially if they're putting a lot of stress on it, which a pitcher uh, is. Um, and I think uh, the, the idea of what you're going to do, I see, so debridement. So right. a, as you know, so the classic is type one debride, type three debride. I, w- I would tell you, and I know we're going to get into this later on, we talk about debridement for slap tears. Uh, and whether we should repair them or not. There's at least some suggestion, and you know this, that we, we probably uh, are fixing too many. Uh, and we know that the success rate in some of these throwers with slap tears that we fix, fixed historically, you know, is, you know, 75% success rate. You know, that means that 25% are failing, even at the young age population that we're fixing. Now, why is that? Well, they're going back and doing the same old thing and putting porking that area. Now to suggest that we can fix it better than God, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, and the way he did it is, is ludicrous that th- those forces are going to be translated back there. Now, obviously the younger you are better healing and then also better ability to rehab when you're younger and right. get out of old habits. I think that that's why the results with slap tears when you're younger, uh, Obviously, there's an age-related focus on it with healing, but it also has to do with the ability to sort of rehab appropriately and uh, sort of the flexibility in some of the tissue in the sense of being able to maintain that rotation, get back your internal rotation. A lot of these, that's why I think the success, you know, in, in, in younger athletes are higher. But there has been this big push that, well, you know, debridement in the overhead athlete you know, it, maybe we shouldn't fix it, or maybe we should be doing a tenodesis, a bicep tenodesis, and, and we can, we'll, we'll start. That was the next, that. that was it. That was the next thing I was going to ask. But so, so to recap, first off, uh, you know, when these patients come in, it all, you know, it all depends on the patient factors and, uh, you know, where they're in the season, their goals, what they're all trying to do. But for in, I guess, in the correct patient or the, in most patients that where it's not an extenuating circumstance, you may first go undergo non-operative treatment, which you try to you know, send them to therapy and have them. Well, what is your therapy? Just, just really quick. What's your therapy protocol? Do you just have them work on rotator cuff strengthening and periscapular? Yeah, it's it's, it's always, yeah. Periscapular stuff is important. These, the, they don't need rotator cuff stuff. So right. the throwers, they get, they get the throwers 10 program, which is typically a lot of band work with rotation, okay. but they get the focus is on the sleeper stretch is where they're lying on their side and internally rotating yeah. their shoulder to stretch that posterior capsule out. And a lot okay. of scapular stabilizing stuff. I think that's extremely important for, you know, these pitchers and, and, you know, to a certain extent, if you catch them early, right, you can potentially get them, you know, back with this sort of 
MRI that's inconclusive for a slap. They got that internal rotation deficit, you know, that's pathologic, meaning 15 degrees. You can really impact them and really prevent that thing from going to a type one plus to a type two. You can really stop it in its tracks if you get the mechanics back, meaning that humeral head more centered, that posterior inferior capsular contract that they've developed better. So their rotations equal internally, meaning their arc is equal on both shoulders. So those are critical things for me in terms of non-operative rehab. Don't just send them for rotator cuff stuff because they ain't going to get, they're not going to get better. You've got to be very specific, you know, with your protocol when they go to an athlete and you got to send them to someone who has experience taking care of these athletes. Right. And then, so when, you know, when, you know, if you have these patients and they've undergone as much non op as much therapy as they can. And then when we're looking at different treatment options, we had different treatment options. We had like, you know, debridement versus bicep tenodesis and then kind of versus slap repair, which we'll get into in a second. But when we talk about debridement, just like you mentioned in those athletic patients, you know, we're just debriding them and then they're going to go and do the same activities that they're doing before and they end up getting the same injury. You know, that's well, one uh, of the theories, uh, I guess. Yeah, I, I would say. say that when you debrid them, right, that right. they're probably going to do a lot of rehab, whereas before they weren't as focused. Like, But afterwards, when you do surgery on a patient, when they go to rehab, it's a lot different, right? There's a lot more oversight, care. Uh, uh, there, it's drilled into their head that, you know what, the surgery is 50%. The other 50% is the rehab. So they right. may they may approach it at a different uh, intensity. Um, and th- there is a component where that may be what's improving them. A little surgery, a lot of rehab afterwards. And so – you know, these patients that, that we're doing our, our debridements in, which was do was do what was like you mentioned a little bit earlier, which are we can kind of use for some of our type two tears or that 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 tear uh, where our where our superior of the whole you know superior labrum where it's a little detached, but not not yet a bucket handle. Now, what patients are you doing a you know a biceps tenodesis? Uh, when is that indicated? So for me, when I started practice. Anyone uh, above 40 was getting the biceps thesis. So my number has come down to 25, okay? So I'm very aggressive doing biceps tenodesis. In terms of tenotomy, you know, you, you write down here, older, lower demand patient um, for biceps tenodesis. You know, for me, it's, it, it's as young as 25 now. So, uh, I, and there's data in the literature, you know, certainly – a uh, 35-year-old it's come down to. And and for me, the idea of fixing a slap in anyone in their 30s is almost, to me, and that's, this is my personal opinion, ludicrous, because we know tenodesis does extremely well uh, in, in, uh, in everyone, uh, except one population is in the throwing athlete, it's very young, that the results are not as good with biceps tenodesis as as in some of the older athletes. Now, I would also say that the results of slap repair in that population is also not as good. So they're fairly, you know, equivalent. So for me, I'm very aggressive with doing biceps tenodesis. In a pitcher who's 21, I'm probably leaning more towards doing um, a slap repair for a type two. But if they have a type four, for example, I'm not fixing the biceps and sewing that together. They're getting a biceps tenodesis because they will be able to throw again with that. If you start to repair the biceps, do the slap, that's a lot of surgery for them. They're not going to be able to throw. You're going to have to end up doing a biceps tenodesis. And look, for me, what's the treatment? What's the treatment for a failed uh, slap repair? It's a biceps tenodesis. And we know it's very successful. And uh, I think one of the things that you're, you're going to see is that as we do, as we start doing primary biceps tenodesis that uh, on some of these throwing athletes, we end up uh, doing when we do primary biceps tenodesis in these throwing athletes, I think you're going to see that the results are going to be better. A lot of these athletes who've had slap tears that were fixed 
then have a biceps tendinitis. That's a revision surgery. They've been through a lot. They have anchors put in their shoulders. I think, I think that's a different population. And then the issue becomes when you, when you see uh, these athletes, they've already had a prior surgery. They're different. And if their results are suboptimal, they, they, those are revision cases. So I think that, that we really have to critically look at, and the study would be a randomized study in the throwing athlete with a type two slap tear, either revive, you know, go to primary biceps tenodesis versus a type two slap tear. And I think that's a hard study to get to get off the board, you know, off the ground because it's randomized. The athlete is going to be someone who's going to want to have it fixed. I think even though you present the data. So I, I think that's a challenging study to do, but you know, I hope someone does it. And really quickly, do you, when you do your biceps tenodesis, are you doing an open sub pec? Are you doing it arthroscopically and putting on the subscap? Or are you just leaving a little bit of the stump and just, like, how are you doing your, what's your yeah, tenodesis so, technique? So my, 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 uh, my go-to is sub pec. So okay. uh, I, I think from a technical standpoint, I do my cuffs in the lateral decubus position. And then you simply take the arm out of traction. It becomes, uh, it, it's really easy. And, and, you just have to get comfortable with doing it. Uh, uh, I think it's a lot easier than any of the, and I do arthroscopic biceps tenodesis when I do my cuffs in older patients, okay. whether it's either super pec uh, or I kind of, you know, incorporated it into my repair, you know, and there's many areas that you can do the biceps tenodesis. You could do it at the level, at the upper portion of the groove, intraarticularly. You can do it, uh, in the groove, sort of super pec, looking in the subacromial space. So you can watch all those videos. You just have to find one way that you're comfortable doing it and doing it well. And for me, it's the sub pec approach. And the theory behind it is that you're taking care of the whole biceps tendon from right. intraarticular, taking it out of the groove. Uh, so if you're a believer that there's groove pain after some biceps tenodesis, then you're going to be a sub pec person and do it in the sub pec region. If you're not a believer in that, meaning that you just cut the biceps and it kind of just, you know, you cut the biceps and you reattach it uh, sort of high up and you keep the groove there, you're a believer that, well, now that you're moving from the glenoid and you're moving your arm around and it's not torquing anything anymore, that's the reason why they get better. So that's their theory as to why I get better. I believe in that too, but I also believe there's a groove pain component as well. Yes, sir. A little bit of both. And uh, before we wrap up here, just a couple more questions is in, in what and we briefly touched on some of them here and there a little bit earlier, but what patients should get a, a slap repair uh, done or what are the indications for a uh, slap repair? So uh, I'll, I'll start with there are some older patients I'll do a slap repair. And when I say older, it's someone who dislocates their shoulder that has sort of the circumferential uh, tear. So for me, that's a different population, right? So they have this instability. So all of a sudden, and that's rare, you know, you, you get an older person who dislocates their shoulder and keeps dislocating. So when I say older in their late 20s, okay, which is not old, but if you look historically, that population should not have recurrent instability. So when they do, for me, sometimes I'm incorporating the biceps anchor to help with that stability uh, post-surgery. Now, um, have I also done labral repairs on patients who have circumferential labral repairs, labral tears, and also do a biceps tenodesis as well? Absolutely. So that patient profile fits, Doc, I still have pain after I dislocated my shoulder years ago. I don't have any more instability. Um, so at that point, what I'm doing is fixing the uh, the labrum for pain, really pain, not so much stability, and then doing a bicep tenodesis because I know that the likelihood of it healing in that in that patient at his age is unlikely. So then I'll do a tenodesis as well. Okay, 
Okay, cool. Perfect. That makes perfect sense. And in uh, a couple, I know that you could probably have a whole, a whole podcast talking about label repairs and the techniques behind them. And, um, and, and we won't b- belabor that point for this podcast, but just a, a couple of quick uh, questions. What what high points would you say that, that residents or maybe even fellows that come near, um, uh, you know, that come that come in should know about, you know, actually doing an, an arthroscopic uh, label repair, whether that be the anchors and, and the angle that the anchors need to be placed in or, or the type of sutures that you use or, or, or just, just some high points that you think. Right. Uh, so so don't tie knots around the, the, the superior labor. Most important thing I could, I could, we, the, the arm rotates baseball players, their, their arm rotates and in maximum extremes, that labrum, it, those knots are going to kind of scratch the humeral head. You know, I don't care how far back you put them on, on it, it, it the biceps anchor torques. It, and if you look at, you know, there are videos out there showing this, you'll see it's just bad idea to put knots out there. Now, the second thing is that you don't want to over constrain the biceps tendon, right? So never, never, never get close to the actual anchor itself when you put these anchors in. There are some people who describe these techniques where they're coming very close to the anchor itself, almost deforming it as they're pulling on some of the biceps tissue while they're fixing the labrum. That if you see as you're you're putting in your knotless anchor that biceps move, the actual anchor, um, wh- where you see the biceps leaving the shoulder and that thing moves into the joint because you're constraining it, those patients do horrible. So do not do that because the biceps doesn't like that. So for me, when I fix these, I fix them way off, you know, the anchor. So meaning that I, con- I try to stay as far away from there as possible because I think in my theory is that there's a lot of variability in that area as long as you're preventing that torque from going beyond, you know, for example, let's call it the one o'clock position and the uh, 11 o'clock position. Those are where I'm putting my anchors to secure, you know, uh, the labrum. So you can see in here, this is well, so that's perfect. Like I, I, I become a little more, you know, closer to the, uh, the biceps, but I think that that's a perfect location for a not, not less anchor, you know, yeah. slap, you know, and some people don't even fix the front, right? Cause they believe it's really the, there's a lot of variability in the front and in these athletes, less is more that avoiding putting an anterior anchor in, um, to prevent over constraining, uh, because there's a lot of variability with a sublabral frame in there. So I think that, you know, we've gone to be much more minimal, minimalist in terms of repair how we repair these in these athletes okay and and is your is your working portal do you, is it more that portal of, of wilmington or you know that that that, that kind of posterior portal they talk about uh is that the your main because you know i mean because you can get the posterior lane through that or do you have any any other right so i think if you're, gonna, as... if you're gonna use a knotless anchor you've got to be in back here You've got to have the scope. I think it's important to have the scope in the front. You can, to okay. me, as a resident, when you fix an anterior labrum, and again, it's all what you feel comfortable with. So right. you can fix, if you're doing a regular bank card, you could have the scope in the front and work through an inferior portal. So both scopes, the scope and your instrumentation portal are both in the front. Sometimes that can be challenging as those two, the cannula, which is right near the scope collide and your hands collide. So for me, fixing this, this posterior aspect of the slap, I put the scope in the front. I work through the port of Wilmington. And so I'll, and I'll keep one cannula in the back. You can do this percutaneously. There are many ways to do it. But for me, I'm having my visualization portal in the front. I also have a, a working portal in the front, meaning that I shuttle sutures as I need to from the front. And then I have one can in the back, which I'm putting the uh, instrument to pass the suture and also the, the knotless anchor through that anchor. And the key is with these knotless anchors, you got to be lateral enough to get the correct angle to insert these uh, so that you're not skiving. 
and is that angle kind of that, that 45 degree angle that you read about that you yeah, want to be? Yeah, they talked about it. At 40, yeah, they, they talked about it being at 45. I mean, it could vary. You know, you can probably go, you know, 35. But the idea is that it's more lateral than you think. So that standard posterior portal that you put your scope into the shoulder, you can't put a knotless anchor through there. You'll, okay. you'll disrupt the entire glenoid cartilage. And in post op, because we know, just like you just said a little bit earlier, half of it is surgery, and a, and a big part of, uh, of of recovery is going to be post op and rehab. Well, what is your typical post op protocol? And, I, and I'm sure it may change if you just have a, a patient that you just do a biceps and a on versus a slap repair. But if we could just go with a slap repair, what would be your example post op protocol for so, these patients? Yeah, so for slaps, yeah, I keep them in a sling you know, for four weeks, I, I'm the same way as you. It depends if it's associated with more instability and other things, but let's just talk about the throwing athlete slap. They're in the sling for, for me for four to six weeks. Um, and I do start therapy at about 10 days. And the key to understand is I make sure that they are not doing any type of extreme rotation, right? So the last thing you want to do is to start working on that external rotation, don't put them in the cocking position right away. That's almost silly. Pendulums, active assist and passive, I think is fine. Even active motion, like lifting their arm, just lifting their arm up is fine. It's it's getting into that rotated position, I think is a problem. And for me, the return to throwing program is, is starts at four months where they start. And then usually these athletes can the younger they are, I can get them back at six months. If they're more of a, an elite thrower at the professional level, it's usually eight months, 10 months, maybe probably even a year. And then okay. collegiate wow. is somewhere is somewhere in between six and eight months. Wow. Well, uh, I think this was a uh, an excellent talk. You know, I learned a lot just, you know, just from talking to you and listening to you talk about lay rooms. Uh, you know, these, you know, we talked a bunch about the anatomy. We talked about classifying it. We talked about uh, the physical exam findings uh, of these. We talked about things you should look for on uh, history as well as x-rays, MRIs, some of the treatment options. Uh, before we wrap up here, any, is there anything else that you would want the people to know? Or, you know, if there's one thing that you want people to, that are listening to the, you know, we have some fellows listening to this, we have some attendings that listen to this, and we also have a majority of residents and some medical students too. So there's a wide, oh, wide variety. Well, um, I, but I, anything you want them to know. So I think my, my last parting words would be about how do you learn this topic, right? It, it's, and I, and I think sometimes I see residents, there's so much information out there, they don't know where to start. And I think that, that it's become even more, uh, you know, every, every year there's more information out there. But to me, I don't look at that as a negative, right? I look at that as a positive. Um, the idea of just coming, you know, into the OR and just listening to what the attending says and using that as fact or or that's all you need to know about that topic to me is wrong. You guys should, you know, and uh, girls should read everything about the topic as much as you can and read there. And I always will go, whatever the article is, I'll go right to the discussion. You know, I'll read the abstract, you know, and whether it's a review article, uh, you're reading the whole thing, but even some of the research based articles on flap um, that you read. For me, I go to the discussion because the discussion gets into a lot of the theory as to um, uh, on some of these topics. And for me, it beca became almost obsessive trying to understand why do slaps occur? And you would read the literature and there'd be conflicting things people were saying. And that made it even more fascinating to me to, to delve more into it and understand it more. But I think the key is for residents, you, there's a lot of reading. And the great thing about it is there's a lot of multi, um, there's just m multiple ways to uh, sort of learn this via videos, via actual reading, via surgical techniques. And I think with that wealth of information, it becomes fun to try to be the expert on this topic. And you can do it because I can't keep up with the reading because, you know, but you guys are younger you have better memories than we do now because we're getting older. We're starting to lose our memory. Uh, you guys can do it. And I, and I encourage you to just read as much as possible. 
Um, and uh, it'll, it, it just becomes second nature. You can read these very fast and get to the point and, and, and get a good understanding of it. Oh, well, perfect. Again, um, Dr. Tesoro, we appreciate you so much for coming on the, on the show. Um, definitely, definitely learned a lot. At the end, we always give them, uh, we always give our guests, you know, uh, an opportunity. If you have any type of social media, on, uh, people to follow you on or any, you know, any institution or anything that you want to give a shout out to or have people follow you on or reach out to you. Uh, if you want to, it's fine. If not, that's completely fine, but totally up to you. Yeah, no, I don't have a Twitter or anything like the young guys have. Uh, I just, Perfect. I just love, I love recording my surgeries and I put them out there on View Medi, and uh, you know people reach me through that. So uh, that's that, that's my love when I, I can impact someone on on helping them do a surgery a little better. Um, oh, and yeah. that's that's sort of my approach. Can't lie, I've seen numerous of the videos that you have put on the NYU uh, Ortho uh, YouTube page. A lot of those technique videos I've seen. So thank you for those uh, those cases that you've done and helped me prepare for a lot of cases. So again, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. All right. For those listening, My pleasure. All right, thank you, Doctor Ezra.